Senator Henderson. Mr President, on this most historic day for the Liberal Party of Australia, I am honoured and humbled to make my first speech as a Liberal Senator for Victoria, or my second first speech as a Federal MP, or as Senator Rustin quipped when we flew into Canberra on Sunday night, my first real speech in what is clearly the superior chamber. <laughs> However characterised after so proudly serving the two terms as the member for Corangamite, it is absolutely wonderful to be back. In this chamber there may be different procedures and traditions and challenges in the making of laws which govern our nation and a few more colourful characters. But my mission to be a strong, determined, liberal voice for the people I represent has not changed. Mr President, we live in a truly incredible country. I am here in this place because I love my country and because I have great hopes and dreams for its future. I am here because, through the pursuit of good policy, I want to contribute to building a better nation. I am here because I want to help advance the opportunities for the people who live in our great state of Victoria, particularly those living in regional Victoria and Melbourne's west, where I will be focusing much of my efforts. I am here to recommit myself to the Liberal Party to which I am so proud to belong and to the members of the Victorian Division of the Liberal Party whom I am so proud to represent. And I am here as a proud member of the Morrison government. We have a great Prime Minister. I too believe in miracles. Mr President, it was on this day, 75 years ago, that the Liberal Party of Australia was formed. This is cause for great celebration. On the 16th of October 1944, in a hall not far from here, a coalition of non-Labor organisations united under the leadership of Sir Robert Menzies to create what would become Australia's most successful post-war political party. Menzies' mission was clear. He said, what we must look for, and it is a matter of desperate importance to our society, is a true revival of liberal thought which will work for social justice and security, for national power and national progress, and for the full development of the individual citizen, though not through the dull and deadening process of socialism. Five years later, at the 1949 general election, in contrast to Labor's petrol rationing and divisive plan to nationalise the banks, the Liberal Party offered a post-war Australia full of opportunity and freedom. Menzies spoke of the freedoms and liberties which were and remain the essence of liberalism. The real freedoms are to worship, to think, to speak, to choose, to be ambitious, to be independent, to be industrious, to acquire skill, to seek reward. Australia was at a crossroad and Australians chose the liberal road. And whenever they have chosen the Liberal Road in all elections since, they have done so because we have offered that fundamental choice. The times have changed, but not our values. The forgotten people, the Howard Battlers, the quiet Australians, Australians from different eras but with the same needs and ambitions. From Menzies to Morrison, Liberal governments throughout our history, in partnership with our coalition partners, the Nationals, have worked hard to foster, not hinder, aspiration, encourage equality of, of, of opportunity, not outcomes, and harness the hard work and enterprise of Australians rather than prosecute an ethos of dependency and self-entitlement. We did this through a post-war economic expansion which tripled our economy and boosted home ownership by initiating the end of the White Australia policy, by responsible economic management and by a succession of international trading and security agreements, none more important than ANZUS, which has been the cornerstone of Australia's security for nearly 70 years. I acknowledge in particular 
John Howard, a doyen of our party and our longest serving living Prime Minister, who secured our borders, delivered ten surplus budgets, historic tax reform and captured the heart of the nation when he reformed our gun laws after the tragedy of Port Arthur. In my last first speech, I spoke of the impact of Nurse Lynn Beavis, one of Port Arthur's heroes, whose story I told as an ABC journalist. When tragedy or disaster strikes, whether it be crime, drought, flood or fire, there are heroes and champions to be found in every community. People like Y River CFA Captain Roy Moriarty, who led his community to safety in the face of the 2015 Christmas Day bushfires in which 116 homes were lost. It was an honour and privilege to support the communities of Wire River and Separation Creek in the face of such adversity and to fight for justice on behalf of bushfire victims who were treated so appallingly by Amy Insurance. Our nation now faces another disaster, a soul-destroying drought which is ravaging scores of communities across Queensland, New South Wales and parts of Victoria. That is why surplus budgets are so important, because it gives us the capacity to make the big decisions, such as our $5 billion future drought fund, vital to building the long-term resilience of regional communities. As I undertook to my pre-selectors, my very first task as a new senator was to travel to northern Victoria to meet with farmers. Many are facing crisis. In the Murray-Darling Basin, managing the impacts of drought is extraordinarily complex. We must always ask what more we can do, whether it be a serious review of environmental water allocations for the Murray or new water trading rules to combat the corporate water hoarders and price takers. Water storage infrastructure is vital. In contrast to the $1 billion we are investing with the New South Wales government to construct new dams, the Victorian government is refusing to greenlight any new dam. This decision must be reversed. Similarly, Premier Daniel Andrews must allow the mining of onshore conventional gas. Victoria is at a tipping point, facing blackouts over this coming summer with now the highest electricity prices in the nation. We need more dispatchable power, and we are making plenty of efforts in terms of our contribution to driving down energy prices. But we need to see the gas taken out of the Otway Basin onshore as the state permits offshore, this is desperately required. Australians expect their governments to make the right decisions, the tough decisions. Under the leadership of Prime Minister Morrison, Treasurer Frydenberg and Finance Minister Senator Cormann, our plan for a strong economy includes returning the budget to surplus, record jobs growth, lower taxes and a $100 billion infrastructure spend. We are leading the way in combating global economic headwinds. We are also working extremely hard to invest in the, the support Australians deserve, deserve in health, skills and training, education, aged care, childcare, disability and housing, and in taking the tough action to combat family violence, suicide, mental illness and religious discrimination. And yes, there is much more to do. I am proud of our government's work to overturn bad laws, such as the carbon and mining tax, which, is, which destroyed jobs and stifled investment. I am pleased that some in Labor now understand the folly of punishing aspiration and taking from Australians their hard-earned savings by pursuing reckless policies on energy, franking credits and negative gearing. Our government's election win on the 18th of May was a reminder that quiet Australians expect their governments to get out of the way whilst providing certainty and stability and confidence in the future. These are the same quiet Australians who, I believe, are rejecting the noisy and insidious march of the extreme left, particularly in Victoria. The animal rights groups attacking our farmers, 
the climate warriors gluing themselves to the streets, and the inappropriate gender-based activism in our schools and on our sporting fields. Even our basic right to speak freely is under challenge. I recently addressed an audience where I was asked not to say ladies and gentlemen for fear these words might offend. This is just silly. As for the push to declare a climate emergency, taking strong action on climate change is important, and we are, including by reaching our Paris targets. But I say, please visit the Alice Springs Women's Refuge, which is in reality a homicide prevention centre for Aboriginal women and their children escaping horrific family violence. That's where you find the emergencies. In August 2017, I visited this refuge as chair of a House of Representatives inquiry into family violence law reform. I urge the government to adopt all of the inquiry's recommendations, including ensuring that allegations of family violence can be determined early in proceedings so as to protect both victims of family violence and those against whom false allegations are made. I commend the Attorney-General's eminently sound proposal to merge the two family law courts. We are listening. We know more urgent reform is required. This is a jurisdiction which so often results in increased risk, trauma, prohibitive costs, a lack of justice and unacceptable delays. The member for Menzies, Kevin Andrews, will make an excellent chair of our new joint select inquiry into the family law system and I am confident will drive the next wave of urgent reform. Lived experience matters and it's disappointing to see the unwarranted attacks on Senator Hanson by those opposite. She shares many of my concerns and will make an important contribution. Mr President, in my first speech in the other place, I committed to being a strong local voice for the people of Karangamite, which would sometimes require only a whisper, at other times a roar of determination. It's fair to say that over the past six years I've done a lot more roaring than whispering. And on that note, I acknowledged members of the G20 Alliance in the chamber today in the gallery. And I want to particularly congratulate Stephanie Asher on her election last night as the new mayor of the city of Greater Geelong. And Mr President, I can't apologise for the roaring. The people of Karangamite deserved no less. Major road and rail infrastructure investments, a new international terminal for Avalon Airport and dozens of upgrades to community, sport and surf life-saving facilities. Our more recent announcements, including a $370 million Geelong City deal in partnership with the state and local councils, an incredible $2.7 billion for faster rail infrastructure and the Howitzer Defence Manufacturing Project, will drive another wave of opportunity for our region. At the last election, despite a terrible redistribution in Karangamite, which carved more than 3 per cent from our margin, we never gave in. We fought Labor, the Greens and the unions at every turn. And as patron senator, I am ready for one hell of a fight at the next election. As part of that commitment, I am delighted to announce that we are up and running already in a new permanent office in Murrable Street, Geelong, as the only Liberal senator located in regional Victoria, a key part of my Senate action plan. At its heart is my determination to stand up for every community, big and small. Places like Dean's Marsh, uh, Senator De Natale, who is not here at the moment. Um, Dean's Marsh is one place where we are building a new community pavilion, and this is the Liberal way. Mr President, our government is working hard to invest in greater skills and training, but too many students continue to fall through the cracks. One idea is to revive federally funded Australian technical colleges, a great initiative of the Howard government, so that students seeking a technical rather than academic education 
are provided with a comprehensive pathway. Of those few which continue to operate, including one in Hamilton, Victoria, they are kicking major goals. Another major concern is the need for better regional transport infrastructure. Across Victoria, delivery of projects like the Geelong rail duplication, for which I fought so hard and secured, with a bit of help, $850 million, uh, is far too slow. There is better progress on the Ballarat line upgrade, backed by mainly Commonwealth funding. But we are still waiting for the state to match the $2 billion our government has committed to faster rail between Geelong and Melbourne. The plan to construct a second duplicated rail track between Wyndham and Sunshine and a dedicated line and tunnel through to Southern Cross Station as part of the Melbourne Airport Rail Project, to which we are contributing another $5 billion, is incredibly exciting. It will cut travel times by 32 minutes and provide a desperately needed separate service to Melbourne's Western Growth Corridor. There is concern, however, that the state may seek to compromise this plan. This simply cannot happen. My next mission, I say with a roar, and I think uh, the minister is behind me, <laughs> is to ensure fast rail to Melbourne is also funded for Ballarat and Bendigo, cities we have included in our fast rail plan. And with $4 billion on offer from our government, let us please just build the east-west link. Mr President, at this time of such global uncertainty, and I join with Senator Payne in expressing deep concern and distress about the situation in Turkey and Syria, we face a new crossroad. To keep our nation strong, we must take the right road on food and water security and Australia's security and strategic interests. We have taken enormous strides to combat terrorism and foreign interference, support our intelligence agencies and build our defence capability. Our relationships with our key allies have never been more important. But we need to call it out when things aren't working. Australia's critical infrastructure assets, our airports, power stations, data networks, communications infrastructure and ports, including the Port of Darwin, should simply not be falling into foreign hands. There is also scope, I believe, to re-examine other aspects of our foreign investment laws, such, such as restricting, perhaps by way of allowing only leasehold, the foreign acquisition of prime agricultural land. I believe in free, competitive markets, in the importance of foreign capital to help us build a better nation. But we must never forget that we are a country before we are an economy. As your Senator for Victoria, my first duty is to our country. In the last parliament, I was honoured to serve as Assistant Minister for Social Services, Housing and Disability Services. I'm proud of the many reforms we delivered in disability and the NDIS, especially accommodation support for those with very high needs. We know there is much more hard work to be done. This remains one of the government's highest priorities. We continue to invest very heavily in housing and homelessness, including the First Home Buyers Deposit Scheme. Inspired by the incredibly successful Keystart program in Western Australia, I would like to see this initiative extended to other Australians facing housing stress, such as older women. Today, Mr President, I don't propose to tell my life story. This is in my other first speech, which Senator Canavan said I should have just used today. I do, however, want to say a few thank yous to the people of Karangamite for the honour of serving them. Thank you. To Prime Minister Scott Morrison and Treasurer Josh Frydenberg, thank you for your enduring support and friendship and your wonderful belief in me. This means a great deal. To Senator Cormann for all your support since I joined this chamber and became a senator particularly in relation to my new office. I thank you. To my other Liberal and National Parliamentary colleagues in this place and the other place, thank you for your friendship and support, particularly to those who endorsed my pre-selection—Tony Smith, Michael Sukar, Alan Tudge, Jason Wood, 
Greg Hunt, Dan Tien, Kevin Andrews, Senator Payne, Senator Reynolds and Senator Hume, for which I am most grateful. To Ron Finkelstein, Andrew Hurst, Simon Frost, Nick Demiris and Jocelyn Griffiths, a sincere thank you. To Michael Ronaldson, a true mentor and friend, thank you for everything you have done for me for more than a decade. I could not have won Karangamite in 2013 without you. To my Liberal family in Karangamite, particularly Robert Charles, Ian Cover, Robin Cox, or Crazy Granny, as my son Jeremy calls her, Bob Vinicom, Ian Smith, Tom Rowe, and Carol Walters, and to those we have lost, such as the inspiring Alan Cover, thank you for your commitment, your dedication, and your friendship. To Victorians, including Liberal Party members across our great state, thank you for the opportunity to serve. I look forward to working hard as your strong Liberal voice for Victoria. To my friends and family and supporters, some of whom are here today in the gallery, I could not do this without you. Thank you in particular to Jeff Kennett, Dennis Napthine, Ted Bailey, Peter Credlin, Fiona Ogilvie O'Donnell, Bev MacArthur, Helen Kroger, Tim Smith, Richard Reardon, Louise Staley and Michael Kroger. I am who I am because of my family. My wonderful mother Anne, a dynamo in everything she did, including as a Victorian MP and Cabinet Minister, and my inspiring and caring father Michael, who loved nothing more than to shoot, sail and camp with his family under the stars. I miss them every day. I want to thank my magnificent siblings, Jody and Andrew, who I love very much. They are my rock. Together with Robbie, Gus, Marcus, Louis, and now Gerwin, I am blessed. And to the most special person in my life, my 13-year-old son, Jeremy, another miracle. As I have always said, I love you to infinity and beyond. Having a mother in politics is not easy. At least as a senator, there will be no more billboards. <laughs> but without your support and patience, I would never have embarked on this incredible journey. Thank you.
I could ask senators to resume their seats so we can proceed to valedictory statements. Pursuant to order, the Senate will now move to valedictory statements. I call Senator Sinodinas. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'll be resigning from the Senate in mid-November after eight years in this chamber and uh, four decades in and around politics and government. It's been a privilege to serve. I love this place and all that it stands for. Now. Um, I did not grow up thinking I would be a politician. Um, I've always been an avid follower of news, current affairs and politics. Uh, I studied economics to learn how the world works. Uh, I joined the public service to apply those uh, principles to real world problems. And I joined John Howard's office from Treasury in 1987 because I admired his brand of liberalism and his pluck and courage in advocating reform from the hard yards of opposition. I enjoyed being at the coalface of policy and political advice. I returned to the Treasury in 1989 when he lost the leadership, but, he came back, but I came back in 1995 when he came back as opposition leader. His career, I think, is testament to the benefits of recycling. <laughs> I stayed with him until 2006, serving for nine years as Prime Ministerial Chief of Staff. When I left in 2006, I thought I was done with politics. Been there, done that, the whole shebang. But Helen Coonan and Rick Forbes encouraged me to consider making a contribution on the front line. I thank them for their faith in me and to my wife Elizabeth, cautious at first but backed me, encouraging me to have a go, for which I'll always be grateful. More about her later. And thank you to Maurice and Connie for escorting me into the chamber that October 2011. Well done, Maurice our first female defence minister and doing a sterling job in foreign affairs. And Connie remains a good friend and I think did an outstanding job as our Pacific minister. And I thank the party leaders who backed me. I was Tony Abbott's shadow parliamentary secretary in opposition and assistant treasurer in government. And I pay tribute to the fighting spirit of Tony Abbott who took us from opposition back into government. I was Cabinet Secretary in Malcolm Turnbull's first ministry and later ministry, Minister for Industry, Innovation and Science, a role I relished. Malcolm Turnbull brought a rational lens to policy development and a laser-like focus to problem solving. But the best part of my job has been to meet so many of my fellow Australians from different parts of this great continent. Whatever our race, colour or creed, we're bound together by our good fortune in being born here or making the brave decision to forsake our ancestral home and settle down under the best country in the world. Yeah. For me, Australia is an immigrant nation. It's in our DNA. So too our unique indigenous heritage with over 65,000 years of ongoing relationship with the land. This is a big country worthy of big ambitions. We should be infinitely optimistic about the possibilities that lie before us. Australia's best days lie ahead, and we owe it to ourselves and to the world to make the most of our stewardship of this place. We are and should always be a beacon of hope to the rest of the world. For me, the Australian way is to live and let live, engage in fair play and leave no one behind. We owe a special obligation to the minorities in our midst. These are the quiet Australians who need our help most. It includes Indigenous Australians who seek more control over policies implemented in their name, disabled Australians who want to be defined by their potential and not their disability, and those other marginalised Australians looking for gainful employment and social acceptance. The test of being Australian or being an Australian is not genealogy, but whether we adhere to timeless values that make our democracy work. 
Politics is a noble calling, a vocation that puts the community and its aspirations before our own. And this parliament, as I said in my maiden speech, is still the pinnacle of the Australian achievement. Our liberal democracy, with the rule of law, independent judiciary, English as our national language, our free press, all of these things have helped to sustain our prosperity and social harmony. Institutions matter. Respect for tradition and conventions matters, particularly in this age of disruption, technological, political and cultural. My brand of liberalism seeks to conserve the best of the past while adapting to the future. It is constructive progress and not change for change's sake. And how rapidly the world around us is changing. Trust in our established institutions such as politics, business, the churches, the media has been weakened and there's a palpable anger in so much of the public discourse. Democracy is increasingly questioned. There's a reheated romance in some quarters with old-fashioned socialism. And one person's push for diversity and inclusion is another person's divisive identity politics. We complain of a lack of privacy and, in the same breath, gladly surrender so much of our personal information to vast platforms and networks. Our data is being monetised to create new goods and services to our benefit, but not necessarily always with our knowledge. And these platforms have also created new possibilities for control and intimidation of citizens. Information is being fragmented and weaponised. The broadcast media is increasingly polarised and politicised. And the proliferation of media outlets means that people can select their news and facts to suit their own preconceptions and biases. The universities, hitherto bastions of free speech, are under attack from within and from outside. The scientific method is under attack, even as we benefit daily from the fruits of rigorous evidence-based inquiry. If we cannot even agree on basic facts, how can we have a civilised discourse? Look at the climate change debate. And in the age of Twitter, the court of public opinion can be quickly turned into a kangaroo court and natural justice runs a poor second. Intuitive responses are preferred to mature reflection. The liberal democracies are open societies. That is our strength and our vulnerability. We cannot meet threats to our democratic institutions by adopting the tactics of authoritarian regimes. That undermines our fundamental values and beliefs. Our role in this place is to stand up and defend those beliefs and to remind successive generations of the price that's been paid to build the democ democratic institutions that we enjoy today. As a Liberal, for me first and foremost, that means upholding the sanctity and freedom of the individual and her or his capacity to exercise responsibility. The role of government is to preserve and, where possible, extend the domain of human freedom and opportunity. Freedom is right and freedom works. The success of the Australian economy over the last three decades is no accident of resource endowment or geography. It's overwhelmingly a testament to the benefits of economic freedom. The opening up of the Australian economy to market forces has not been easy. Along the way, there have been winners and losers, but the benefits are overwhelmingly positive. We are bigger, stronger and more resilient to external shocks. Look at how we dealt with the Asian financial crisis and absorbed the resources boom and its aftermath. There's been no repeat of the stop-start policies of the 80s and 90s when inflation was snuffed out through swinging increases in interest rates, precipitating major economic downturns. Now, the productivity impulse generated by earlier reform programs has ebbed in recent years. Reform is a journey, not an endpoint. We need to double our rate of productivity growth to maintain the average income growth of recent decades. That will require more freedom and more investment, public and private, domestic and foreign. The world is awash with savings looking for a home. Improving investment returns will require more focus on science and innovation to build new industries and jobs, ongoing action to reduce the costs of doing business, including streamlined regulation, and in the absence of lower company taxes, other investment incentives as foreshadowed by the Treasurer. Ben Morton's deregulation agenda should encompass not only paperwork and process, 
but structural impediments to our competition, innovation and growth. The Australian economy needs more competition. Governments should be removing barriers to entry and policies that benefit large incumbents. That's why I support consumer data rights and open banking and possible extensions of that to telcos and energy companies. That's why I think differences in the capital treatment of large and small banks should also be ironed out to create a more level playing field. The compulsory system should also be as open and competitive as possible. We need to tackle structural causes of high fees and address the fate of low income earners who accumulate balances that are largely eaten up by fees. The income threshold at which compulsory super cuts in has been the same since the super guarantee was introduced in 1992. Now, <clears throat> I know this caused us grief at the time, but I strongly support the changes to super that we made in our 2016 budget. They were necessary to create more equity in the system going forward. We could not, breach, we could not preach expenditure restraint to the public at large while protecting concessions that largely benefited only a few. And I applaud the policy courage of the then Prime Minister, the then Treasurer, who is now our Prime Minister, and the continuing Finance Minister in prosecuting that case. And the focus of the review should be on structural changes to address the ageing of our population and not short-term revenue raising. The Prime Minister is right to pursue mutually beneficial, evidence-based reform of our industrial relations on the basis that it does not undermine existing terms and conditions. The world of work is changing around us. Flexible workplaces, digitally enabled, are the way of the future. New types of jobs are being created. Learning is lifelong, and the pace of change is throwing up opportunities in the new service economy. I'm very optimistic about the net jobs benefits of automation, which will free up workers for higher level tasks. Machines should do machine work, not people. History demonstrates the benefits of technological change. We don't need a universal basic income, but governments creating opportunity for workers to acquire the skills to embrace this new world and the dignity of work. If we prepare properly, we can become empowered and confident to embrace new technologies. The government's skills agenda is central to this process. We can imagine the jobs of the future using tools like Fathom, an Australian company. Michael Prittis and his colleagues have created a powerful tool to analyse the impact of automation on jobs, companies, industries and entire economies. Their platform is an essential planning tool that other governments are using to guide policy development. We should too. I'm passionate about the role of government in catalyzing new industry development to capitalize on the emerging technological trends. I was proud to initiate the review of our space industry capability and to appoint Megan Clark to head the review group. Illness prevented me from announcing the space agency in September 2017. I think you did, Burma, in the end, in my absence, as a good South Australian. The infusion of funds through the agreement with NASA, recently announced overseas, will encourage Australian companies to become part of the supply chains for new space ventures. The cyber sector is also one of great potential for Australia. I believe we can be a world leader. Us Cyber, under Michelle Price, is doing a great job in tackling impediments to that development. On my watch, the Commonwealth supported another Michelle, Michelle Simmons, a former Australian of the Year, by providing funds into the joint public-private venture that's working on a functional quantum computer, the next frontier in revolutionising computing capacity. The point by doing this sort of stuff at the government level is to help Australian industries get on the ground floor of new developments, and that's when you can create a world-leading edge, and that's very important going forward. Embracing alternative energy sources such as renewables is an opportunity rather than a cost. The transition in the energy system cannot be reversed and technology is constantly evolving to create appropriate firming and backup that is essential to avoiding volatility as more renewables enter the power grid. I'm optimistic that new technologies will keep reducing the cost of energy and lowering greenhouse gas emissions. We should keep our options open on nuclear energy but that raises a host of broader issues I dare not go into here. 
but I am proud of what the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation is doing in the field of nuclear medicine. With the support, I think, of the opposition as well, and Kim Carr was uh, very supportive on that occasion, I was able to get legislation passed to enable ANSTO to create the world's first nuclear science and technology incubator, on-site facilities for students, and the technology park that will make Lucas Heights a jobs hub. When it comes to climate change, policymakers have to act on the basis of the best scientific evidence available. We rely on the intelligence agencies to give us their best advice on security threats, and of course, final decisions always rest with us as the elected representatives. The same model should apply to climate matters and almost everything else impinging on our health and, natural, and the natural world. I once tried to get Senator Roberts, together with CSIRO, to have a debate about climate change. We had, I think, about two or three meetings uh, through you, Mr. President, Senator Roberts, and I think the CSIRO scientists are still in rehab recovering <laughs> from, from those meetings. But, but that was part of what I thought, in my role as science minister, was important to get people together and actually talk about these things and try and find common ground where possible. I enjoyed the role of Cabinet Secretary. I dealt across the breadth of executive government and had the opportunity to contribute across all portfolio areas. I had no personal agenda or access to grind. My interest was in good process as a basis for good policy and ensuring that the Cabinet agenda reflected the government's overall aims and objectives. The aim was to ensure that the facts and subsidiary issues had been sorted out so that the Cabinet only needed to focus on the major decisions required. <coughs> a well-functioning Cabinet is at the core of good government. Prime Ministers must give their colleagues the full opportunity to have their say and sum up fairly and comprehensively the mood of the meeting. That is the best guarantee that Ministers will respect the process and observe Cabinet confidentiality, without which there can be no frank and free exchange of ideas and advice. One of the things I notice working both in the Prime Minister's office and in the Cabinet is that in our system, Prime Ministers can have a lot of power because they can determine not only who gets into Cabinet but what the agenda is. Uh, and we're, but we need a system of collective decision making because a team approach is also always better than a one-man band approach. I thank the many public servants I've worked with over the years and most recently the, the secretaries and deputy secretaries, principally Martin Parkinson, who I've known for over 30 years, and David Gruen in PM&C, Glenis Beecham, who was secretary of the industry department uh, and who did a great job with me, and Heather Smith, who arrived just as I was going. With so many competing sources of advice in the public arena, an apolitical APS is more important than ever. I hope the Thodi review of the Australian Public Service sets the scene for continued investment in capability and there is more focus on working across the silos and engaging in scenario planning on major cross-portfolio issues like ageing of the population. How's that for a bit of jargon? The Turnbull government's development of city deals is something I was particularly keen to support because I believe it will be it will revolutionise how the three tiers of government cooperate to develop coherent infrastructure and planning policies to maximise the prospects of cities and regions. I remain a believer in a bigger Australia. I support the proposed policy, a population planning framework. Uh, Tudgy's here, or he's gone now, but, but the PM's here. Welcome, PM. Um, I support the proposed po population planning framework to coordinate state and federal infrastructure and other services with our immigration and set settlement policies. Allied with our initiatives for fast transport links with the regions, this can give substance to decentralisation policies and improve housing affordability. Governments have an important influence on the economics of regions. In some cases, it's about how we keep existing regional industries going. In others, it's about how we facilitate transition. As industry minister, I work closely with South Australia and Rowan Ramsey, the local member, to find a buyer for the Wyala Steelworks. There were no short or medium-term alternatives to provide a jobs hub for the region. I'm pleased that the GFG Alliance stepped up to give Wyala a new start. Both in the Howard era and as patron senator for the Hunter, 
I was privileged to participate in efforts to redevelop the region after the closure of the BHP steelworks. Once the region processed the closure of the steelworks and was ready to move on, there was an opportunity to focus on building areas of comparative advantage to create new industries. This was facilitated by the adoption of what's called a smart specialisation strategy and utilising the firepower of that great regional university, the University of Newcastle. Reflecting on my time in the industry portfolio, there are just three issues I, I want to call out. We must keep up the pressure for more collaboration between the knowledge creators and industry to maximise the commercialisation of domestic ideas. I laud what we've done on industry growth centres, our reform of research block grant funding arrangements, the development of innovation precincts, and we should build out the ecosystem as the Canadians have done with their Mars Discovery District so we can fuel the growth of Australian-based unicorns serving global markets. My second point is I support big science. That's capital facilities that allow Australian researchers to do leading-edge research here and to be preferred partners for international researchers. Blue sky research, or what we used to call fundamental or basic research, is not only vital in itself, it's the foundation of so many great inventions and innovations. My, with my good friend, Senator Birmingham, I developed a roadmap for funding such infrastructure. And while I'm on the subject of Senator Birmingham, can I thank him for his policy courage in the education portfolio? Uh, he reformed childcare, but also what he did on school funding. I know it was hard, and I know we had to make compromises along the way, but you set out a framework to clear up and clean up the sector. Well done, Simon. I signed off on our $129 million 10-year big science strategic partnership with the European Southern Observatory to secure the future of optical astronomy. That was a down payment on this agenda of looking after research infrastructure. I was also gratified that by the end of 2017, resourcing the next iteration of high-performance computers was agreed. My third point on industry is very straightforward. I'm a strong proponent of strategic government procurement in industry development. The best example I can think of is what we've done with the creation of the defence industry portfolio. It will encourage domestic spin-offs from our record defence spending to help create sovereign industry capabilities. The rise of an assertive and powerful new superpower in China is challenging the liberal order built up painstakingly over 70 years. Now is not the time to retreat from that order or for nations to practice beggar than neighbour policies. We've all gained immeasurably from the peace and globalisation of trade and investment that's resulted from the international rules-based order. The liberal West must be united in resolute defence of the decent, humane, universal values that underpin that order and to find ways, continue to find ways to deepen China's engagement and commitment to that order. The world needs a strong and prosperous China that has a meaningful stake in the existing order. The lesson we should take from history is not the winner-take-all approach at Versailles in 1919, but the generosity of the post-war 1945 settlement when the United States led the creation of a new order encompassing allies and former enemies. It was one of the most generous acts of enlightened self-interest in recorded history. But if I can paraphrase Teddy Roosevelt, I think we should maybe talk softly but carry a big stick. As a country, I think we must keep building up our military capability and continuing to strengthen our core alliance with the United States and our strategic partnerships in the Indo-Pacific. We can be very confident about our ability to punch above our weight internationally in pursuit of our national interest. The resuscitation of the Trans-Pacific Partnership minus the US was a great achievement that required hard work by Australia and Japan in particular. Australia has also been a global leader in calling out and legislating against foreign interference in domestic politics and taking measures to protect critical infrastructure. I want to thank the Prime Minister for the opportunity to continue to serve this great country. The celebrated election win was, in my view, no accident. It was the product of a lot of hard work and campaigning experience by a leader who's probably the most complete politician of his generation. I want to thank John Howard for being the best boss ever. 
When I left in 06, I respected him even more than at the beginning, not only as a reformer but as a role model in all ways. I would not be in parliament if it were not for the New South Wales branch of the Liberal Party. I know this branch sometimes gets a bad press, <laughs> no. but I have to say I've been struck by a number of things. The first thing is that when you join a party, your obligation is to uphold its name and live up to its ideals. It's not a vehicle for personal ambition, but a movement for the advancement of the community. And as elected representatives, we have to keep faith with our lay members and volunteers. Because overwhelmingly, in dealing with the New South Wales branch, what I found are people who seek nothing for themselves but everything for their country and their party. They are the decent backbone of this country. To the long-suffering party directors, who are often the unsung heroes of our success, to my good friend Tony Nutt, who was my partner in crime for so long in the PMO, to Chris Stone, who has become such a successful director, having just won New South Wales and federal elections here in New South Wales, state and federal elections. Andrew Hurst, who cut his teeth in the PMO with the rest of us and who has gone on to be such a formidable leader and campaigner in his own right. Brian Lochnane, who had so many victories and so much experience over so many years and has remained a friend. And Crosby Texter, not just good pollsters, but true believers who were signed on to the bigger vision of what we were about. And party presidents like Nick Greiner and Shane Stone. Shane Stone is a close friend of mine, a great Australian, and if you ever want to get frank and fearless advice, he's your man, although I'd encourage him not to put it in writing. <laughs> Thank you to my wonderful, wonderful staff. Um, led by my good friend Peter Stevens, who has been helping me with the transition to the next life, to Andrew Hamilton for so capably leading the team while I was on sick leave and preparing so meticulously for the campaign. He now works in the PMO. A major thanks to the lioness, Fiona Brown, who worked with me in the PMO those years ago and who set up my Senate and ministerial offices. She has been the anchor through the toughest political times and I owe my longevity in this place to her. She is now in the PMO too. Notice a pattern? <laughs> my special thanks to Stephen Brady, a PMO veteran and my best friend for over 30 years, who visited me every day I was in hospital. He became my case manager, offering solace and the best advice, even if at times I didn't like it. To Richard Pye and the whole Senate team, thank you for your hard work your top-level advice, your unfailing courtesy and helpfulness, and above all, your fair dealing with all sides. That's what makes institutions like this what they are. Thank you to my friend Matthias for being such a great wrangler of the Senate vote, but also a role model of someone who came here in his 20s and achieved so much in his adopted country. George Brandis is a good friend whom I admire as a classic and consistent small-l liberal. But a special debt is owed to my good friend Erica Betts, my first leader in this place. It's a bit like your first love, your first leader. <laughs> Very platonic man love. We, uh, Eric and I did not always agree, but he has always had my back and I admire his great dignity and courage, even in the most difficult of personal circumstances. Mr President, you've been a true friend through thick and thin. You and I could write a book about the last few years, but I don't think we want to blow the whole place up just yet. Um, I must say that I fear you're an endangered species, being almost the last economic rationalist in captivity. But keep up the good fight. Most importantly, thank you to my family. Elizabeth, a conscript of politics, but kept it together through the hardest of times now fully engaged in her own career. I said my maiden speech, tougher, smarter, a better judge of people than me. She's completely ruthless. She should be the politician in the family. I haven't won an argument in 20 years, and, and, and the kids seem to have taken after her. So Dion, who's in Sydney studying for the HSC tomorrow, 
Isabella and Alexander who are here. I'm sorry I've been away so often. Hopefully now we can spend real time together. I hope you don't get too bored. Um, finally, colleagues on all sides, may I echo something I said in my maiden speech. Thank you for the welcome I've received since I've been here and for the many courtesies shown to me. I've listened to many speeches in this place, all well researched and argued. I don't doubt the sincerity of the convictions that you bring to the table. I hope that, like you, I can look back on my career and say it in a small way I helped to make the best country in the world even better. I'll ask senators to resume their seats. Senator Sinodinas must now sit and listen to other people talk about him for a while. I'll give him a chance to thank his House colleagues. Senator Cormann. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I rise to pay tribute uh, to our good friend and valued colleague, Senator the Honourable Arthur Sinodinas. Arthur has provided outstanding public service to Australia for about four decades. He's now preparing to take on his next assignment for Australia to represent our country with our most significant friend, ally and economic partner, the United States. Over the past 40 years, the last eight years as a senator for the great state of New South Wales, Arthur has served our country and for, the most, for most of that period our liberal cause with dedication, commitment and great distinction. When he entered the Senate in 2011 replacing Helen Coonan as a senator for New South Wales, Arthur was already a formidable presence of long standing in coalition circles. He was a giant 
of our liberal cause already. He clearly stood out from other first-term politicians with his strong reputation as a respected political and policy contributor preceding him. Arthur's rise began in earnest in 1987 when he took the position of senior economic advisor uh, to John Howard, then the federal leader of the opposition, and to become uh, our longest serving um, recent uh, liberal prime minister, uh, and I would argue, well, certainly one of our greatest liberal prime ministers and our greatest prime ministers of Australia ever. It was that initial two-year stint which laid the foundation for Arthur's incredible distinguished career of service to our country and the Liberal cause so far. In 1995, he returned to John Howard's office. Within two years, he was appointed as his chief of staff. And as a close confidant to the Prime Minister, he was widely recognised as one of the most influential uh, contributors in Australia. When Arthur entered this chamber eight years ago, it marked the return of an extremely skilled operator and one of our best policy brains to the coalition ranks. In opposition, Arthur played a key role in developing the policies that drove the coalition to victory at the 2013 election. He chaired the coalition's deregulation task force to cut government red and green tape, which led to significant reform, reducing the cost of doing business in Australia after our election to government in September 2013. As Assistant Treasurer in the Abbott Government, he invested his significant expertise on economic and fiscal policy matters to help the new government build and foster a stronger and stable economy. As Cabinet Secretary uh, in the Turnbull Government, he provided significant strategic advice at the heart of the government while ensuring all the important processes of government ran smoothly and that all the different policy perspectives on different issues had been appropriately heard and considered before a decision was made. In 2017, Arthur became the Minister for Industry, Innovation and Science. And later that year, it was Arthur who uh, led the charge and who put Australia onto the path towards the establishment of a national space agency. And as he uh, indicated uh, in uh, his remarks, was, which was announced uh, soon, soon thereafter. Recent announcements of further investment in our space industry underscore the importance of Arthur's vision for space exploration. When Arthur delivered his first speech, he described John Howard as a fighter, someone who was prepared to take the knocks for what he believed, pick himself up and have another go. Arthur has emulated his distinguished former boss in many ways, but it was in his private life that Arthur was forced to really channel this fighting spirit when in 2017 uh, he was diagnosed with cancer and forced to take leave uh, to get well again. It was so good to see Arthur return to the Senate uh, in good health after his tough 18 month battle cancer free. And just in time to help us win the 2019 election. Talk about a fighting spirit. As Arthur embraced the survivorship phase of his battle with cancer earlier this year, he fittingly announced government funding for services at Sydney Cancer Care a facility Chris O'Brien Lifehouse. Politics is about helping people and improving lives. Arthur's altruistic nature is not just confined to politics. He has been a member of a wide range of pro bono boards, including the Mary MacKillop Foundation, the Aboriginal Employment Strategy and the Australian Institute of Management. He is, of course, a proud Australian of Greek heritage and has always been active in the local Greek community here in Australia. It was a combination of uh, his strong community involvement, public service to our nation, and his contribution to the development of economic policy and reform, uh, which saw him recognised uh, through his appointment as an officer of the Order of Australia in 2008. Arthur has forged an incredibly impressive career, and unsurprisingly, there is more to come. Through his long-standing, very senior contribution to our country, from the back room to the front line of politics, Arthur is the perfect fit to pick up from Joe Hockey as our top international envoy. As our next ambassador to the United States, Arthur goes to Washington at a pivotal time in our deep and enduring relationship with America. Having recently celebrated 100 years of mateship between our countries, Arthur will help us lay the foundations for the next 100 years. Arthur, we wish you well as you depart this place. 
for the international stage, and we know you will represent Australia's interests with distinction, as you always have. In your first speech in 2011, you said that you hoped to be able to look back on your career and say that in a small way, you helped make the best country in the world even better, something that you also referenced today in your remarks. Australia is in a much better and stronger position today, and Australians have, a be have better opportunities to get ahead today because of the contribution that you have made so far. And of course, there is more to come. Our country is fortunate to retain your services in Washington. On behalf of the uh, coalition team in the Senate, uh, we wish you all the very best in your future endeavours and, you know, in particular, uh, in, uh, your, in taking on the responsibilities as our ambassador to the United States. Thank you for your service so far. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. I rise on behalf of the opposition to acknowledge the valedictory remarks of Senator the Honourable Arthur Sinodinus Ao and to reflect on his career. At the outset, I express the regret of Senator Wong that she could not be here to deliver these remarks. She absolutely wanted to do that personally. Um, I may lack Senator Wong's gravitas, but I'll give her my best shot anyway. Uh, Senator Sinodinus has had a career spent substantially in public service. He was a Treasury officer. He served as Chief of Staff to Prime Minister John Howard for a decade. He has served as a Senator since 2011, and he will serve as Australia's next Ambassador to the United States of America. Public service is indeed a noble calling. Unlike our, our leader, Senator Wong, Senator Arthur Sinodinus was born in Australia, but like many others in this place, they share a great pride in their multicultural heritage. That the son of a merchant mariner, who was also a lifelong member of the Siemens Union of Australia, and a part-time seamstress, who were Greek migrants, could take a seat in the Australian Senate, says much about our country. In his first speech in 2011, Senator Sinodinus correctly identified the enabling power of education and its importance in ensuring our children grow up with a global outlook. This remains as relevant as ever today. As a minister, Senator Sinodinus often actually answered the question. This, we believe, is an example that others can learn from. In 2014, after a typically unproductive series of exchanges with Senator Cormann, Senator Wong did make the point in an estimates hearing, and I quote, it was so much better when Senator Sinodinus was here. Notwithstanding the ICAC problem, at least we got questions up. Can we bring back Arthur, even if he's conflicted? On another occasion in 2015, Senator Wong asked, and I quote again, can we have Arthur Sinodinus back? It was much more fun. Senator Cormann refused to answer that question too. <laughs> We know that Senator Sinodinus has confronted significant personal health challenges in recent times. It is a reminder to us all to keep our work and conflict here in perspective. It is a tribute to his determination and tenacity that he, did, that he not only returned to the Senate, but now prepares to undertake a new and demanding role. Senator Sinodinus and Senator Wong also sat next to each other on the election night panel on ABC television this year. It is fair to say that he probably had a more enjoyable night than she did. But Senator Wong, and she particularly wanted me to emphasise this point, uh, would like to acknowledge and thank you publicly for the gracious way you conducted yourself that night, a difficult night for those of us in the Australian Labor Party. Many others would have been much quicker to gloat in victory. That Senator Sinodinus did not reflects much about his character. Of course, Senator Arthur Sinodinus and Senator Wong have not had a completely deferential relationship. It would be accurate to say that during the life of the Abbott government, Senator Sinodinus came under sustained attack from the opposition in connection with the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption. Sometimes it was not always smooth sailing. In March 2014, the opposition spent the best part of a morning attempting to require Senator Sinodinus to make a statement to the chamber only to have the motion fail. I am confident that his colleagues are very grateful for the practice the opposition got in these circumstances, which has enabled us to refine our approach and achieve a greater success, degree of success on subsequent occasions with other ministers. 
Whilst the opposition will never shy away from applying a par appropriate parliamentary scrutiny where necessary, I'm sure Senator Sinodinas will be very happy if he is never asked to remember anything to do with Australian water holdings ever again. Senator Sinodinas will take up leadership in one of our most significant and consequential overseas posts, our embassy in the United States of America. The relationship with the United States has been one of the central pillars of Australian foreign policy since the Second World War. The United States is one of Australia's closest friends and staunchest allies, and the enduring nature of the alliance between our countries reflects the fact that we have shared histories, interests and values. Values like democracy and freedom and respect for the rule of law. Both countries benefit from the relationship which has succeeded and deepened over many decades under the leadership of both major parties in both countries. Senator Sinodinas will join a distinguished lineage of occupants of the post of Ambassador, which includes Richard Casey, Norman Macon, Andrew Peacock and Kim Beasley. Of course, the closeness of our alliance does not mean that we will always agree with every aspect of American policy. One of the challenges Senator Sinodinas will face is communicating Australia's position respectfully but clearly when policies are introduced that we do not think are in Australia's best interests. Of critical importance for Senator Sinodinas will be developing, maintaining and strengthening relationships across different branches and levels of government. Whilst much of the public focus is on the presidency and our relations with the White House, this cannot be the sole point of connection. There is also vital cooperation on counterterrorism and defence. Often overlooked is the work our diplomats do to engage and build networks within the United States Congress, which is critical if we are to advance crucial interests on matters such as trade and investment. So too are direct relationships at state level often bypassed in conversations about the alliance. Yet there are great opportunities for Australia that can be harnessed through meaningful engagement at this level. Senator Arthur Sinodinas has confronted political and personal adversity during his time as a senator. Throughout this, he was anchored by personal convictions shaped by values, character and belief. Senator Wong reflected on the fact that he has been a worthy opponent and a respected colleague. The opposition thanks Senator Arthur Sinodinas for his service in this Senate and wishes him well as the principal representative of Australia in the United States. I'm going to take this opportunity, rare opportunity from the chair, to make some comments following Senator Sinodinas' um, valedictory speech. And I'd like to reiterate everything Senator Cormann said on behalf of the government and the Liberal Party and add a few of my own observations from having worked so closely with Arthur. To those of us who remember the years before 1996 and the early days of the Howard government, even at a very young level. Um, Arthur is a giant. Um, he took over his role as Chief of Staff there in difficult days and he mentioned his offsider Tony Nutt and they formed a duo that is probably the best uh, political staffing combination that this building has seen. Arthur was always present for key decisions, um, rarely sought attention, rarely sought credit, but was always integral to so many of the successes of that government. But I'd like to talk about Arthur the person. Um, Arthur, Arthur's capability and the confidence he inspired in people was demonstrated by the address he just gave, um, and a, one that not many of us could necessarily make upon our valedictory. But all, working with Arthur was always one of learning the importance of politeness, of being open-minded, of humility, and how that can inspire confidence in people around you, in people that work for you. Not for Arthur, the inflamed rhetoric that occasionally takes over modern politics, always the reason, the idea, and treating people well. I was privileged to serve as his parliamentary secretary. It was actually a job I requested at the time. We shared a lot. I gained a lot more than I think I contributed, and I learnt a great deal by working with him. He's always been open to ideas. He's always been offering very helpful advice, including to some of us who might be occasionally young and impulsive or a little bit, a little bit passionate about things. But the advice and the way in which he worked with others is an exemplar to all of us in this building. Arthur and I also shared some health challenges at around a similar time. Mine was serious but not as challenging or as critical as Arthur. 
And the way he kept in contact with me and the way he came through that is a testament to the character of the person. The speech Arthur just gave encapsulates what, so, what drove so many of us into politics in the 1990s and what we aspire to do. The values, the commitment to open minds and the commitment to the greater good. Most importantly, to share and ensure that others enjoy the opportunities that he so proudly outlines he has had. Arthur's departure is a loss to this parliament, but proudly not a loss to the people of Australia through the office he is going to serve us now at a very important time. Um, we are fortunate to have worked together. I am fortunate to have worked with him, and I am fortunate to call him a friend. Oh, Senator Davey. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I rise today on behalf of the Nationals in the Senate. Um, unfortunately, our Senate leader had other commitments. But um, the Nationals sincerely want to congratulate Senator Arthur Sinodinus on the astounding contribution he has made to our great nation through his service in this place, both as a staff member and as a senator, and to lament his leaving. It isn't a stretch to call Senator Sinodinus a great Australian. He served for nine years as Chief of Staff to the great John Howard prosecuting the reform agenda that helped to insulate Australia from the global financial crisis. But not content to leave his contribution to our country at that, he was then appointed to the Senate to replace another great senator, Senator Helen Coonan. Since then, Senator Sinodinus has provided leadership, sage advice and intelligence to all of us on this side of parliament, and he has certainly treated us in the Nationals as part of that team. Senator Sinodinus, though a Liberal, is a staunch coalitionist and has almost always been a friend to the Nationals. <laughs> we on the conservative side of politics will be forever grateful for the Senator's policy acumen and practical political skills. No one brings policy and polis politics together quite like Senator Sinodinus. In fact, he wrote the rule book for that marriage for the Howard government. The syn synthesis of these two attributes has also contributed strongly to the long-standing coalition between the Nationals and the Liberals. For example, my former boss, Senator Ron Boswell, and a, a great friend and an absolutely genuine and hard-working advocate for the Bush, would often drop by unannounced into the Prime Minister's office and felt absolutely comfortable doing so. However, when the PM wasn't available, which wasn't surprising, Senator Sinodinus would gra graciously meet John Ron and faithfully pass on the nature of the discussions to the PM, particularly at that point in time, Telstra, which uh, was the subject of numerous uh, robust discussions. This was a policy area of particular interest to Senator Boswell. And Senator Sinodinus used his ministerial positions, once he joined the Senate, to the betterment of Australia as Assistant Treasurer, as Cabinet Secretary and Minister for Industry, Innovation and Science. And I note what he's done for the nuclear industry at Lucas Heights. As the Senator said in his maiden speech, Observing John Howard convinced me that politics is not worth a candle unless you are fighting for something. And these words, words resonate with all of us in the Nats, because that's why we are here. We're here to fight for rural and regional Australia. People like me and like my colleagues who live and work and raise families in rural and regional Australia deserve the same opportunity and prosperity as, as others. And so we need to take a leaf out of Senator Sinodinus's books and work the politics and the policy to deliver for the people we represent. Senator Sinodinus's term hasn't always been plain sailing, and we acknowledge the quiet dignity that he took in 2017, stepping back from his ministerial duties and ultimately the parliament to concentrate on his health. His approach to his leukaemia diagnosis was the same as his approach to solving policy and political conundrums. No fanfare, instead discreet and humble determination. These must have been troubling times for the senator and his family, and both sides of the chamber 
were very relieved and pleased to see him return. The senator's advocacy since then for others who experience leukaemia is an absolute inspiration. He is a living and breathing demonstration that cancer doesn't always win. The next chapter of his service to Australia will take place in Washington rather than Canberra, and while we will miss him in this place, his appointment as the next Australian ambassador to the United States of America means he won't be lost to public life and public service. I sincerely thank Senator Sinodinas for his service here as senator, a minister, a coalition partner and as a friend to the nationals. Australia and our closest strategic ally are both looking forward to your next chapter. All the best. Senator Bragg. Thank you very much, Mr President. It is a great honour indeed uh, to take a few moments of the Senate's time uh, to reflect on a, a great man, uh, a, one of the greatest sons of the New South Wales Division of the Liberal Party, um, and a really amazing supporter of other people in Senator Sinodinas. Uh, I know that this evening people have reflected uh, rightly on Senator Sinodinas' professional career and his enormous contribution to our country as a patriot. I wanted to mainly uh, spend this time on the personal side. Um, yes, Senator Sinodinas uh, served for 10 years as John Howard's Chief of Staff. Uh, yes, he was a Cabinet Minister. Uh, yes, he will be um, a great ambassador. <coughs> yes, he's been the President of the New South Wales Division. But perhaps the greatest thing he's achieved professionally has been to win the universal respect of the New South Wales Division of the Liberal Party. And no, no mean feat, no mean feat, Mr President. Uh, Senator Sinodinas has a particular form of liberalism which I think is compelling. And it is, as he described in his own words, uh, live and let live. And uh, very much I think that is a, a good approach. It's more than just live and let live. It's also forged in his economic training as a brilliant Treasury economist. Uh, that you can't do anything as a country unless you secure the economic footing. And I think that has been reflected in all of the contributions that the senator has made, and certainly uh, even in his valedictory speech, still making the case, still presenting new economic ideas, uh, seeing that as the foundation uh, for the success of our nation. Now, um, I have done some digging around for these remarks, and I can reveal that um, as a, as a young boy in Newcastle, uh, the senator was interested in uh, playing war games and t uh, toy soldiers. There you go. Uh, and uh, of course, um, also um, has been a, a very proud uh, member of the Greek Australian community. Uh, and uh, his aunt, antecedents came from, uh, I'm going to get this wrong, Kefalonia, mm -hmm. uh, and has maintained um, a very, very strong link uh, in the, the Sydney uh, Greek uh, community. Now, um, I just, just, just want to say briefly um, something on the, the personal side, that um, it, it, it is a difficult thing, uh, this business, uh, sometimes to get into. Uh, and as a new person in this, um, in this place, I can say that uh, no one helped me more uh, on the pastoral side than Senator Sinodinas. Uh, whether it was uh, writing a reference or giving me a call or seeing how I was going, uh, he was always there for me. Uh, even to the point that every significant event uh, I've held, um, in, in, as far as I can remember, um, uh, Senator Sinodinas has been there uh, for me because he's always supported other people. Uh, it has been a selfless journey, uh, and uh, I think there is so much we can learn from his career of service at the Treasury, uh, as a, a Chief of Staff, uh, as a Minister, and um, so much more to come, uh, and so, mu so much looking forward to your contribution. Uh, in Washington. Thank you very much. Thanks, mate. I thank senators in that case. Now, we are going to re return to the two remaining.